mind. Are you guys ready this morning? Mm, I'm ready too. I'm ready too. First service was a lot of fun. We had a great time in here. Uh, Just talking about the topic today, but uh, man, I I don't know about you, but but have you ever been in a place where, have you ever been in a place where God is developing something in you that you didn't ask for? You know what I'm talking about? It's one of those things to be developed in something you asked for, right? Because you kind of, you know what you're inviting. You know you're inviting God into a, 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 a time of discipline that you're asking for. And so you kind of know what you're going to get or at least a little bit. But when God starts trying to discipline you in an area that you were unaware that you needed, it needed attention, right? Can you relate? And in this particular discipline is one that I think all of us can relate to. And I, I, I know that sometimes it can be difficult uh, to, to, to be disciplined or even talk about discipline in an area because, I don't know, we kind of have this false understanding that we kind of have it together already, right? Come on, sometimes we do, sometimes we do. We kind of feel like, yeah, I've already got that done or that's in the done column or I already checked that box. That's my wife. She's a checkbox person. How many checkbox people do we have? Right, once it's done, it's done, right? The gratification of throwing that check mark to the side of it, right? I'm sort of like that highlighter guy, you know, circler, like lay it out again. Like I'm never done with whatever I'm doing. It's always can be better. I can always get worked on it. Uh, and that's, and the Lord is dealing with me in this particular area. And that is in the area of, get ready for it. It's in the area of waiting. Yeah, yeah. So... For all of you future communicators, this is how to lose the room in about 10 <laughs> seconds, right? <laughs> how, not, how, how to not understand the audience you're talking to um, when you say waiting and everyone moans and groans. And then immediately in your heart, there is tons of regret. <laughs> like, just thinking like, I could have gone anywhere today. I could have done anything today. But to hear a guy talk about wa- waiting um, and I get that. I don't blame you for that because that's a difficult task uh, uh, to do sometimes. But I'm, my hope is that today maybe we can give you just a slightly different angle on the waiting and what that means. And so let me just preface this by saying this. Uh, I am unashamed, unashamedly, I'm unashamedly jumping on what Pastor Jay did last week. It was just, it, it was so good, it motivated me and pushed me in a way, uh, if you haven't heard last week's sermon, but he was talking about the here and the there and the time in between, right? He was talking about the in-between time. And how many would agree that we found ourselves in that place at some point in our life in the in-between season? And what motivated me is seeing hundreds and hundreds of people respond to the altar saying, I'm there and, and I need God to show up. And then, and then I, I, I did also walk away this week thinking, you know, God, in a lot of ways, I feel like I'm also there, but I'm, I'm asking you, God, I want to know how to, to not just recognize that that exists, but I want to know how to exist within that in-between time. How do I develop? How do I grow? If I know this true, this to be true about God, how many know that God only knows advancement? Just, I want to sit for a second. Just want you to think. God only knows advancement. He only knows how to make things better. He only knows how to increase. When he speaks, life happens. Like it just everything in him is about advancing. And if I know that to be true about him, then how can a waiting season be godly? See, there's a portion of what we we have like categorized waiting into a really bad, bad category. Uh, okay, l- let's talk about it for a second. Like, anybody ever waited for something, like something you ordered online and you're waiting for the package to be delivered to your house? You know how like frustrating it is to constantly be checking your phone and the tracking number and like I needed to get here. Some of you men know what I'm talking about when you have something you're trying to surprise your wife with and, and, and you're trying to beat it right before she finds it or or how about this how about just waiting on somebody God, as a kid I struggled with this like like if I was being picked up by a friend who said yeah I'll be there in a little bit we're gonna pick you up take you to baseball practice or whatever you're gonna do basketball practice I would sit and wait at the window and just stare into to 
oblivion, waiting. Like, and then with every tick of the minute, just feeling like I have been rejected and, and they, lo- they forgot me. Well, it's only been two minutes. My mom would be like, it's been two minutes. Just relax. Go do something else. But, but I, would get, I, would, I would get so heartbroken over the amount of time it would take for something to happen. Can you relate? Okay, okay, maybe, maybe not your, your deal. Okay, let me, let, how about just try this one. How many hate waiting at a restaurant? Uh-uh, caveat, caveat here. When you know there's other tables, right? You can see, visibly see, there are tables and there's 20 of us waiting at the front door, but there's plenty of enough seat. I, I don't know about you, but this is a pet peeve of mine. Because I, and my, you don't know what it's like. Maybe you do. Okay, some of you do. Some of you definitely know what I'm about to say. But you don't know what it's like. You know what it's like but to get all your kids loaded up. <laughs> and to have done your due diligence to go through there and make sure they have clothes on and they're ready. They've been given the speech. They know how to act when they get in here. They know what we're going to order. They know the way this is going to go. And then when I get there, you're not ready for me? (laughs) Can I tell you something? That will throw a kink into your life journey. You heard what I mean? I said exactly what I meant to say. Your life journey will be affected by this. (laughs) Not just your dinner. This is the way you think about life if this doesn't go well, right? I mean, just, I, I'm just talking about when you're there and you've prepared and it seems like nobody else is prepared. Yes, yes, yes. And they're looking at you as though you inconvenience them to come eat here today. <laughs> have you felt that? Have you ever, I'm talking about waiting. Or how about when you order your food and it takes weeks to get there? <laughs> Can anyone relate? Do you know what I'm talking about? It's quick. It, waiting is, is, is notoriously bad. Like wait, waiting on anything just hurts. It's painful. It, it's time consuming. It sucks the life out of you. And so when you hear this topic for an encouraging sermon on waiting, I don't blame you for being a little apprehensive and, and nervous about it because there's not, not much good comes from a good wait. I, like, I, I'm just, uh, let me just explain what I'm doing here. Like, I, I'm, I felt like the Lord was showing me something, but I couldn't quite get the title right. I was like, God, I'm trying to communicate something, and I, I know what you're showing me, but I want to communicate it the best way. And, and if you've ever been in a position or a place where you're trying to get your head clear in a house full uh, of people and children, especially children under the age of, of eight, how many know that that sounds more like like a circus a lot, right? Can anyone relate? Good. I got a few moms in here know what I'm talking about. It can be like a circus. And so I felt this way and I was trying to get my head clear. I'm just like, Brian, I'm trying my best, bro, to dial in right here. And it's just not working. It's not working at all. I have to find myself into hidden places in my own house just to find peace. This is my house. I earned this house. I bought this house, and now I can't live in it for my kids and for my wife. And like, anybody know what I'm talking about? So I'm trying to find peace, but Mary Poppins is blaring in the back. And yet, <laughs> I'm in there, and all of a sudden, it's like, I hear this lullaby from Mary Poppins, and I come busting out of my room and tell the kids, hush, 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 shh, listen to this, listen. <laughs> But they're, they're stunned because, like, it was just weird. And I'm like, listen, 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 listen. Where the lost things go was the lullaby. It's a lullaby about uh, losing something but it not really being lost. It's just misplaced. Right. And, and it was perfectly done and time for me to walk into and say, that's what you're trying to say. That's it. So this morning, I'm going to talk about how waiting Waiting in our Western approach to looking at waiting can look like lazy, could feel like disconnected, can maybe feel like um, a great place for anxiety to show up. But I'm, I'm going to challenge that today and say there is a place of waiting where the things you thought you lost are not lost, 
but just waiting to be found. Right? They're misguided, misplaced, but maybe not misplaced is maybe not the word, but they're properly placed. And here's where I'm going to. I'm going to give you the punchline before we get there. And that is there is a place in God that despite whatever you've lost, how many have lost your keys before? Oh my. Lost the remote? What a terrible thing. Right? One of the worst things can happen in society, you know, these days. Your phone? The panic that sets in when you lose things like that, right? right? Everyone has lost something. But, but in this case, I'm, I want to submit to you that, that when God is doing something in you or has seeded something in you and you don't feel like the, fu- the fulfillment has happened or the time has happened or it's not going to happen, then all of a sudden you feel like whatever God has said to you, is got, it's lost its power, it's lost its effect, it's lost its ability to produce something in you. There, there comes in that moment a, a level of discouragement and frustration that has been here from the beginning of time, and I want to share that with you. Now, I have an anchor verse we're going to use today. It's going to be the one we go back to the whole time because I think it's critical. I had the privilege of doing a homegoing service, a celebration service for a friend of mine. His name was Art LaPetra. He uh, attended here, his family attends here. That happened at the beginning of the week and this happened to be his favorite verse. And I thought it was so appropriate uh, for for us to maybe use it today because I feel like there's a lot in it we can get out of it. So let's read it together. It's Isaiah 40, 27 through 31. I'm reading out of the message translation and that's on purpose, right? So if it didn't match there, you can see it on the screens here. I'm going to read it to you, and I've got a couple things highlighted I want, to, I want to hit. So it says this, Why would you ever complain, O Jacob, or whine, Israel, saying, God has lost track of me. He doesn't care what happens to me. Let's stop right there. Anybody ever relate to that kind of phrase? Why has he lost track of me? Have you ever lost your kids? Huh? Have you ever lost your kids? Come on. Yeah, you misplaced them. You got to shopping. They got to hiding in the clothes racks, and all of a sudden, you're lost. But you're not really lost, are you? See, as a kid, you used to think you were lost, but really, the parent almost always knows about where you're at, where you went into the last rack, you know. You haven't really lost there, but, but there's, there's a point where you can get to a place where you say, hey, God, you, you lost track of me. You don't even care what happens to me. Look at the progression of how fast they went. You lost track of me, and now you don't even care what happens to me. Doesn't this feel like sometimes when we're in a waiting period, in a period where we don't feel like we hear clearly what God is saying in the present, and we're having a hard time holding on to what he said, huh? That we get to a place where you don't even care what happens to me. I'm out here by myself. You got me trying a ministry, and you can push me out here by myself. And he says, I love this. Don't you know anything? Haven't you been listening? God doesn't come and go. God lasts. I love that. He don't come and go. He lasts. He lasts. He's creator of all you can see or imagine. He doesn't get tired out. He doesn't pause to catch his breath. And he knows everything inside and out. He energizes those who get tired, gives fresh strength to dropouts for even young people tire and drop out. Young folk in their prime stumble and fall. But those who what? Wait. Wait. Say it again. Those who Wait. wait upon God get fresh strength. They spread their wings and they soar like eagles. They run and don't get tired. They walk and they do not what? fall behind. They don't lag behind. They don't faint, right? It's amazing anchor scripture, but it's something we have to recognize is that though this is sort of like our, our North Star, if you will, right? This, this t- for today's sake, an opportunity for us to say this is going to anchor us, but, but we got to recognize that waiting is like an old pastime. It, did, it didn't just happen to you. There, there's, a, there's a temptation to think that you're the only one in waiting. You're the only one that's ever had to wait for anything. It looks like so-and-so is always getting so-and-so or whatever. That, that's happening for them, but it's never happening for me. Can you relate? 
right? You've been there. Uh, and there's that temptation to think it's just for you or it's just about you or in the sense that it's just happening to you. But I'm here to tell you that waiting started way early on. In fact, it started with Adam and Eve. I want to tell you where it started. This is where it started with them. Let me read a little quote from you uh, from the garden here. It says, gone but not forgotten. It says, the garden, in choosing to eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, Adam and Eve showed rank disregard for the knowledge that God had given them. And we're expressing a preference for knowledge that could be acquired rather than that which was given to them. Can anyone relate? I want you to just take us back to that moment where Eve has been deceived, right? The serpent has got her thinking, right? Literally, the, the conversation is God will not kill you. You will not surely die if you eat of this tree because he doesn't want you to be like him, right? That's the conversation. And in doing so, she contemplates and says, no, this looks good to me. And now that I know it's keeping me from something, it's driving me into a decision for myself. And in doing so, and it didn't harm her, she gives it to Adam and says, hey, this is good fruit. You ought to partake in it. And then all of a sudden their eyes are open. Listen, in this moment, they're saying with their actions, God, what you had prepared for me was not as good. Let me say it like this, is costing me too much time to develop. It, it, the cost to go how you want me to go, in the waiting, I'm now impatient. I want to get to the place you have for me sooner than you have the time set for me. Can you relay? See, waiting, 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 waiting was an issue way, way back. There's a natural thing inside of us, a driven, a, 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 it's generational. Have you noticed this? That, that in this room, we're probably split to about a, well, nine Enneagrams will tell you that's what we are. Like, not that, that's obviously the gospel. That's what we are. But, but beyond that, our number and our ways and our fears, there is this one thought that, that we're all dealing with waiting in some way, form, or fashion. We're all self-medicating the idea of waiting. In the Western approach, waiting is like bad. And so if you're older, you grew up in a generation that said, if you're waiting, then do what you know to do until what you want done is going to happen. Right? So there was a, there was a saying, I'm going to strive because I never want to look like I'm being lazy because that's worse, right? That might be the worst thing you can be called, right? Is a lazy man. I'm not going to be lazy. I'm going to pursue something. I'm going to put my effort into something. I'm going to strive while I'm waiting on this thing that I've been promised to get done. And though it looks like a really good discipline, it's a discipline out of season. It's out of place. And it is actually in self-preservation that you strive, right. not out of trust, which is what God said I have established for you. Yeah. If you'll trust me, I'll, I'll, I have something for you that's so outside of what you want for yourself, but you got to trust me. See, that, that's the call. I, did, did we misunderstand when we said yes to Jesus that that is not what he called us into, this life that is beyond what we can imagine ourselves? He did not come to anoint my decisions. He, he didn't come to make what I do right with the world. What he said is like, what you are has to be submitted to me so that I can create myself in you. How, how else can I be advanced on the earth? It's not so that what I do all of a sudden is justified or glorified under some secret alliance. Not good news? Okay. All right. I'm going to stand right here. It seems a little safer right here. Trust me, there's plenty of planks I'll be pushed out on before we're done, right? Okay, 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 okay. Let, me, let, let me explain. A A Adam and Eve, three things that, that were, were unlocked that were not, were not even in the conversation to start, right. right? Like this one, like dependency. Like when, when Adam and Eve chose to eat the fruit, 
There was a, there was a self-reliance. They were saying that whatever God, you said you were going to provide every need for me, but I'm going to provide for myself. Yes. You told me to not do this, but you probably did that because you're keeping me from being something else. So I can't trust you. That's what you're saying. I don't trust your motive in telling me not to eat it, so I'll do it myself. And so this is what's open. All of a sudden, Genesis 3, 7, immediately the two of them did see what's really going on. They saw themselves naked. They sewed fig leaves together as makeshift clothes for themselves. That's interesting, isn't it? What did they do? What was the action? It wasn't the action of putting clothes on. It's the fact that their eyes have been awakened and now they have to what? They have to do all the work themselves to justify themselves before a God now. Again, right, they, they, they were already walking with God, but now they can't even be seen. They have to be covered. I can't look at you. You can't look at me. And gosh, we know God can't look at us like this. So what we do, we, we take on ourselves the governance of our life. We're going to govern the way this works. I'm just telling you where, I'm just telling you where waiting came from. Don't get all bent out of shape. It's like, this is where waiting came from. I'm trying to, trying to help you see that when you don't feel like you're getting the promotion fast enough or you didn't get your husband that you've been praying into or maybe you've been praying for a baby and it's not happening, you're frustrated with God. I'm just trying to tell you that waiting and that feeling of waiting is an age-old thing. They, they, they've all been doing this, and, and it entered in these things, dependency. That waiting, here, here's the, the young man's approach to waiting. We, we put technology in. That's how we don't wait anymore. All right. right? I don't have to wait on you. I can do everything myself from my phone. I don't have to wait on you to even respond. I don't even need you to like something. I can like it myself. <laughs> like it's that far where I, it's like I, I, can, I don't even need your approval. I will make up fictitious people to approve myself. That, that, I mean, I know I'm using it in a real loose way, but that's essentially what, you, what we do. We, you know, there's, there's more technology to make sure you don't wait for anything. You don't have to wait at a restaurant. There's a, there are companies who just get hired to go buy your favorite food and deliver it to wherever you're sitting. So that your productivity isn't broken. So that waiting never has to, to lay hold. Because the tension in waiting oftentimes does not lead to really good thinking, does it? In fact, waiting for any long period of time usually brings a, a big giant dose of anxiety, anxiousness, worry. Come on. See, if you ha there are people in this room that if you had to be by your, yourself more than five minutes in your thoughts, <laughs> That could be a scary five minutes, right? And so because of that, you just avoid that. But that's not the that's not kind of waiting I, I want to lead into. I'm talking about the waiting on the Lord, the letting him be who he's going to be. And when we didn't do that, this is what we lost, our dependency. We said we're no longer dependent on God, we're dependent on each other. And he said, oh. He said it like this, who told you you were naked? Right? So in his, in his case, he's saying, the last time I left you guys, I was the only one talking in the garden. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So who, who told you? Who told you this was the problem? Okay. And so in their response, they lost this thing. There was like, okay, we have to cover ourselves. We have to, out of our own work, out of our own effort, yeah. right, to protect ourselves. He was their protector, but then all of a sudden they have to protect themselves instantaneously. Okay, okay, okay. You, you don't want to hear that. Pain. Pain came in. Uh, Genesis 3.16, I will greatly multiply your pains in childbirth. You'll give birth to your babies. And in pain, you'll want to please your husband, but he will lord over you. Pain. Pain. Nobody talked about no pain. When she was made, he wouldn't be like, I'm so glad I made you, but this is going to get really bad. <laughs> no, there was bliss and complete confidence. There was, there was this dependency on a God that whatever came, we didn't worry because we knew he was present. But when we decided to say, we want that job, 
He says, oh, you want that job? Well, with that job comes managing the pain. Anybody ever had some kids? Mm, oh, see, you know, that felt painful. Mom, right there, just like, mm, <laughs> hey, we've done had some kids. You know, like, <laughs> come on. But just in it sounds, just in it is a grieving, you know, like, just come on, pain. Come on, the, 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 it, we don't hear about that till this point. Okay, there's pain. What about time? Time begins. All of a sudden, there's a deadline on his life. What? Like, God, it was just, it was a little fruit. It was a little fruit. That seems a little extreme. I'm with you, I'm in the garden, we're working together, and now it's Genesis 3, 18 through 19, and it says, the ground will sprout up thorns and weeds, and you'll get your food the hard way. Planting, tilling, harvesting, anybody know what I'm talking about? Adam alluded to this earlier, right? Until you return to the ground yourself, dead and buried. You started out as dirt, you'll end up as dirt. Well, this, 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 it went, went so fast. It was like, it was a bliss and joy to, I'm, you didn't say I was going back to the dirt. Like, how, how did I have to go back to the, he, it's because he's going to redeem it. We know that. He's going to redeem mankind. But I'm trying to tell you where waiting came from is right here. It's like, hold, hold on. Wait a minute. God, have a little patience, would you? Right? But he says, no, I, I, I want you to have the fullness of what you want. To govern yourself. Dependent upon yourself and all that comes with it. Right? I don't want to just do all bad things here. I'm going to give you some hope. I can tell you need it. We're already at that place. <laughs> Listen, there's a place in waiting in that in-between time, Josh, where oftentimes I think this is a misconception, is that the in-between time that Pastor Jay spoke of last week, it's a transitional piece, but I also would encourage you to think of it this way. There's also a time in your life where when you weren't grateful for here, so you want what's there, and so he's keeping you in the waiting till you can become more grateful for here. That I'm, just, I'm just telling you, there's a, there's a place where you can hang here if you want to, and you can, you can have all your eyes set on where you're going. But I'm just telling you that God's setting you up. If you'll let him, he'll pull you in close into this thing and say, if you'll trust me, the waiting isn't as bad as you think. In fact, it's, it's not that you're losing, it's that I'm developing something. How can the word waiting be a verb and be a stagnant motion? <laughs> to wait and yet and yet nothing it's because in him there's always something happening on your behalf and when you lose sight of it you begin to take more control over the outcome because you say well I think God needs my help he's been a little quiet too long and so if I'll assist him by setting up this or setting up that how many know that those things have to be confronted because it's that that he's trying to develop you in the in-between time. He doesn't want you to just hang into this place where you don't know to go here or there. It's not a black hole. It's actually a strategic place for him to build the necessary character qualities you need to carry the next season. And if you can't see that, you'll be pushed into or you'll push yourself or invite yourself into a season you're not ready to carry yet. Adam and Eve. Okay, so I've done all that. Let's, let's go to the next slide. I'm going to talk about these five areas right here. These are things that waiting can produce in you if you allow him. If you will allow him, he will produce these things in your life. And it will be the things that get you ready for what God has for you. That's either in there or here or anywhere he wants to put you. This is what he's trying to strengthen in us. This is them. I'll start with the first one. If you allow the waiting process to go well, and that means you just leaning into him, he wants to do this. He wants to adjust your priorities. 
In the quiet time and waiting time with him, it's usually my priorities are the first thing that go. What I thought was priority, like in my drive and in my, uh, in my agenda, my go, right? That priority that I thought this is the main thing, God usually in this point, point brings me in and says, Scott, hey, like I know you have this, but I'm trying to work. Okay, let me give an example. When, when you feel the pressure to do the work and to be at work and to give your life blood to the work, and God's trying, I'm trying to reprioritize your time because you got some kids that need some attention. But I'm trying to prove myself in the work. Are, can you hear me? If I can prove myself in the work, and then, then, then I'll get the, the things I need that I can be a better dad with. Uh-uh. No, see, in, in, in Christ, he says, no, 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 no. Because see, like all the striving, that's reserved for me. And if you'll let me do that, and then let me use you in a way where you're developing the things that only you can do. You see, you're my, <laughs> I love this. See, God the Father views us like the sons and the daughters. And he's saying, stop worrying about what I am taking care of. Right? And so now pass down to me, he says, and this is what I'm trying to tell you. You got kids. You be the father of your kids. You be the one who invests into your kids. And then you work that. And so there's no worry. You don't have to worry about being that. I'm, you, you're playing your role. And so adjusting our priorities, it's key. He wants to adjust that. What is your, what is your priority? Why, what, what, what do you deem important? What, what, what are you putting value on? And what, how are you spending your time? I want God's answer, but I don't want to spend time with God. What's your priority? I want the God of the universe to move on my behalf, but I don't want to sit down and talk to the God of the universe. Okay. Well, that's going to be tough. Right? And we wonder why we walk away with unanswered prayer. I told you it's going to be full of good news today. Like, I, I, look, we either, we either want to grow or we just, want to, we just want to turn the cheek, right? We just want to act like we didn't see that. I'm just telling you, in order for us to be used by God to the full capacity of what he wants to do on the earth, we're going to have to address these things. Yes, we're going to have to look them square in the face and we're going to have to make internal adjustments. Or we will repeat this cycle over and over and over and over and over and over and over until somebody shakes themselves and does it. I'm saying, why not us? Let's do that. Right, because he wants to do this. He wants to test our faith. Hold on, hold on, time out. I didn't sign up for no testing of the faith. No, sir. No, sir. Come on. How can a God test us? How unfair can he be? How, listen, look, and I saw some of y'all driving into this parking lot today. And I had one question. Have they been tested? I mean, just think about if we just released. Like in this society, nobody wants to test anything because it, it might reveal it right, might reveal something about somebody that they don't want revealed, like they didn't study. So we don't test anything, we just turn the cheek. We're like, are you studied? Yes. Well, good. Here's a giant car. Run it out in the road for us, right? Like, we would never do that, but I'm just saying there's a purpose in testing. How about this? How did we think that if gold needed to be refined by fire that our faith wouldn't? But that measure of faith that he gives us, he says, I want to make sure that it's, it's leaning into me, not onto you or an agenda. I want it to be me. So our faith is, how about this? Our motives are going to be purified. See, in that middle time where we're waiting, it's where our motives get readjusted, recalibrated to where they're supposed to be. Why am I, why am I in this? Why am I praying this? Why do I want this? It's our motives that have to be tightened up in this moment. That happens in the waiting period with him, if you'll let it. It'll increase our gratitude. Man, if there has ever been an age where we need to start being grateful again, 
the consumer mentality, the, the idea that more is better. Can I tell you, there is a place of contentment when we're, when we're gratitude, we're thankful. Yes. Come on, we're, we're just thankful. I, I'm, I'm not, don't get me wrong, man. There's, there, I, I, want, I want things, I, I, I strive for stuff too, I, I get it. But I'm just saying like, there has to be a better balance of my gratitude to my want. And, and nobody's going to control that for you. Nobody's going to come in and police that for us, Christian. That, that's internal. That's self-aware. I have to know there's been a season where I've been real greedy, and I haven't been thankful for where I'm at and what I, what, what I have. Thankful for the relationships that are in my life and thankful for the mom and the dad and the grandmother and the job and the things that God has provided for us. Come on, listen to me. There's gratitude can grow here. It's not a dead hole. It's not, not, it's, it's a place, it's actually a real fertile place, this waiting place. Don't believe me? Think, think about where does, where does the spring hide in the winter? Waiting to be revealed. It's hidden away in a waiting place. It's not that it's gone, it just mysteriously approaches. It's that underneath a waiting time for it to be exposed. You have to think that this is where he has us. If we can really see it, he wants to develop us. He wants to develop gratitude, but dependency, he wants us to get back, to return dependency again. So that when I wake up in the morning, that I say, God, this is your day. How can I be involved in it? God, how, how do you want to use me in the way this day is going to play? How can I be a blessing to the people around me today? God, how can I? I have a dependency. God, I have needs. But God, those needs don't supersede your ability, right? I, I, I can't let need dictate my decision making. Can I tell you, if you do that, you'll, you'll spend your whole life trying to catch up. Get out in front of it and declare who God is. He is the provider and the, uh, and the he, he, has, he has so much at his uh, um, disposal for you and he wants to give it to you. He's not withholding, making you earn it. It's not, this isn't an earning thing, this is a repositioning thing. Uh, uh, Rick, you, Rick Fernandez and I were talking after the first service, but we're talking about what happened was is, the eyes of Adam and Eve were open because they were uncovered because they came out from the covering. You're right? And so with, with that concept, think about it like this. Like we have to be in his covering. We have to get under the hand of God. It's not a, it's not a you have to prove yourself. It's just a submission of God, you're in control. It's deciding that you're going to let God be God and you're going to be you. But we want, we want God to be our bro or our homie or our friend, huh? And we want to be God. I want to decide how it works. I want to decide the way it, come on, listen to me. There's a place where we have to hide in him in that place of waiting because this is what he wants to build in us. Hey, can I give you some scripture that maybe hang your hat on in each one of these? Because I feel like when times get difficult and you're trying to figure out where, where do I go with this? How, how do I let him do it? How many know you got to turn to the word? Don't turn to opinions. Gosh, everyone in here has got an opinion right now. Don't want to hear it. All right? All right, keep it to yourself. All right, I already know this is getting long. I already know. But I, I'm saying everyone's got an opinion, but, but I'm just saying like it's the word of God that will sustain you long after the preacher's words have fallen, the worship has faded. Come on. When nobody, it, nobody's around to encourage you, Jesus Christ is saying, I'm every present. I'm everywhere. I'm right here, very present. I'm very close. I'm very near. Lean into me. Wait with me. Isaiah says that those that wait on the Lord will renew their strength. When we hear a scripture like that that should be an anchor to our soul, why is it that we spend a lot of our time in a place of weariness? When we know this is what he promised. Those that wait on me. That, that, I heard that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to strive. I'm going to really put a lot of extra effort in this week. No, he said, wait. If you're going to strive, strive in waiting. <laughs> like if you're going to use the principle of strive, strive in the direction of waiting. 
force yourself to sit there until he moves. We don't do that very well, right? It's uncomfortable, but it's powerful. Okay, let me, let me show you some scripture on this one. So let's talk about our priorities. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. So no wonder we don't give up. For even though our, other, um, our outer person gradually wears out, our inner being is renewed every single day. We view our slight, short-lived troubles in the light of eternity. We see our difficulties as the substance that produces for us an eternal, weighty glory for beyond all comparison because we don't focus our attention on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what, what the, but the unseen, excuse me, realm is eternal. Come on, doesn't it bring life? When, when our priorities are not about what we can manifest in the physical, but what we can celebrate in the unseen, who he is when nobody else is looking. Come on, the unseen, what he's done generations before you ever got here. Seed that was sown in the ground. See, here's the thing about waiting. Oftentimes you think, man, I can't stand that God's got me in this waiting period, but you don't understand that he's been doing a work for generations over here that's just going to come into the right alignment at the right time. But if you get ahead of it, you miss your window. If you get in front of it or behind it, then you miss an opportunity that God had ordained for you to move into something that he's placed in your heart. It could be ministry. It could, oh, it could be a business that you've been sitting on that the opportunity just didn't come at the right time. And I'm just saying, if you'll wait on the Lord, let him renew your strength. And in that, he will reprioritize your life. And then the unseen becomes valuable again. The unseen's got to become valuable again in the church. Who he is is enough. Who he is is enough. We don't have to make up more things about him. He's all inclusive. Gosh, he's amazing. All right, go to the next one. Priorities to change, faith that's going to be tested, 1 Peter 1, 4, and 7. We are reborn into a perfect inheritance that can never perish. Everyone say never. Never. Never be defiled and never diminish. It is promised and preserved forever in the heavenly realm for you. Through our faith, the mighty power of God constantly guards us until our full salvation is ready to be revealed in the last time. May the thought of this cause you to jump for joy. Even though lately you've had to put up with the grief and the many trials, but these only reveal the sterling core of your faith, which is far more valuable than gold that perishes. For even gold is refined by fire. Your authentic faith will resort and uh, result excuse me, in even more praise, glory, and honor when Jesus, the anointed one, is revealed. Woo! Listen to me. Listen to me. When our faith is tested, I love this first phrase here. It says, we are reborn into a perfect inheritance. Perfect. Everyone say perfect. Perfect inheritance. Not a sloppy one. Come on, a perfect inheritance. Who is our inheritance? Who is it? Jesus is our inheritance. We will never perish, never be defiled, never diminish. Listen, our faith has got to be in this waiting time where he can say, I'm renewing something in you that can never be taken away. I'm renewing in you that trouble can't diminish. You see? Faith is being built. Okay, so let's go to the next one. Our motives, purify our motives. Hebrews 4, 12 through 13. For we have the living word of God, which is full of energy, like a two-mouthed sword. It will even penetrate to the very core of our being where soul and spirit, bone and marrow meet. It in, uh, interprets and reveals the true thoughts and secret motives of our hearts. There is not one person who can hide their thoughts from God. For nothing that we do remains a secret and nothing created is concealed, but everything is exposed and defenseless before his eyes, to whom we must render an account. How to hang your hat when our motives are out of sync. Come on. Everything we think, we say, we do is seen before the Lord. And the good news is this, he's not afraid 
Uh, you don't believe it. Okay, so, okay, okay, okay. I'll give you another uh, uh, Old Testament uh, reference. Do you remember when Aaron, uh, or excuse me, when Moses went up to the mountain to receive the, the, the Ten Commandments and the instructions on how things are going to be laid out, right? Now, mind you, the children of Israel and everybody else said, we don't want to go, you go. Do you guys remember how it started? They're like, it's too scary. We don't want to talk to God. Moses, you go. You be our, our mouthpiece, our representation. So they just said, they distanced themselves from personal responsibility. That's what happened. We're going to take a step back from personal responsibility. We're going to push our man out there and just see if he survives. All right? Moses, you do it. Moses disappears. He's gone a little too long. Why? Because the children of Israel have decided that we're tired of what? Waiting. <laughs> like, I'm not waiting anymore. We don't even know what happened to Moses. That's what they're saying. We don't even know where our man is. He's been gone so long, we don't know what happened to Moses. Well, so this is what we're proposing, Aaron. We want a God we can serve. We need an idol. We need something we can make sacrifices to. So he gathers everyone's gold, right? Brings it all in, refines it, builds and molds a golden calf. Sets it up and people begin to dance and to sing and to eat and to literally sacrifice before this yes. idol. Yes. Yes. Now, now, listen to the irony of this. Listen to how wild this is. At the exact moment that Aaron is giving in to the, the impatient motives of the children of Israel, right? The, I don't want to wait anymore. At that same moment, God is actually defining Aaron himself with a destiny. God is speaking to Moses on behalf of what Aaron and his family are going to represent. And says to Moses, now this is what I've determined about Aaron, but you need to get your boy. You need to get your boy. You need to get up off this mountain. Your boy's done lost his mind, and we ain't even got started yet. That's my version, right? You need to get your boy. And that's what he said. He says, you need to get down there and deal with this thing. Now, now why is this important to mention? Is that despite Aaron's pressure to produce something, to quiet the waiting, God says, I haven't disqualified you, Aaron, for what I actually called you to do. See, what you're living in is a version of what I've actually called you to oversee. I want to know how many of us are living in a version of what he actually called us to do and to become. Because we got impatient with waiting on him. Right? That's what I'm trying to say. When your motives get changed, they get back into alignment. And he says, hey, that's not the right spirit, Scott. That's not the right motive. That's not the right heart. I want to correct that because if I don't correct it, you're going to take credit for when it happens. That's what happens when your motives are gone. You'll credit everyone else like a giant golden calf for leading you out of Egypt. Now, you know that had to upset God for real. No, I done done all these plagues. I done got all these folks packed up. I done got their clothes to extend. I've been feeding them old greedy folks this whole time. And then you going to give a golden cow what I did. You going to credit a cow? If I were God, I would have wiped him out too. Right? And that's what he wanted to do. Let's just be real about it. God said, get out of the way, Moses. I'm going to kill somebody today. <laughs> Thank God for, for a man who will stand in the gap. Had Moses not stood in the gap, Aaron's dead. Aaron's dead before the next bull is sacrificed before that thing. Aaron's gone. Right? But there's a man who stood in the gap. I'm just trying to say, like, sometimes God will send people into your life that you don't even know are standing in the gap for your potential. You don't, you don't even know they're... That's why, and, and I almost talked about honor today, but I'm not going to do it, but why we need to honor our leadership and the people that God's brought to our lives is that there are times where they're standing in the gap for something you don't even know about. You've made decisions in your life and they're standing in the gap with intercession saying, God, God, there's more. There's a destiny. There's more to it. There's more going to happen in their life. Can I tell you, we got to honor that. Moses was doing that on behalf of Aaron. But the beauty of our God is this. is like, I'm trying to define for you, but you're being impatient. 
Oh, man, I don't want to be impatient. I want to get like that. Okay, okay, okay. Gratitude, gratitude. Colossians 3.17. And, and whatever you do, in word and deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Whatever you do. Come on, say whatever. whatever. Yeah, but like, I'm, but like the work, like when I work, whatever. Like when you're raising your kids, whatever. I, I don't, whatever you do. Yeah, but we, we're making decisions where we're going to eat today. Whatever. <laughs> Look, and, and you think that, I, I know it sounds goofy. I know it sounds goofy. I get it. But I'll tell you what it will do. It will create a discipline in you to credit him for all things at all times. Listen to me. I don't take anything for granted. I, I'll give you another example today. Give you another example. And in, in, in the way of, of coming today, I, f I felt like there, there's some anxiety was trying to crop up on me on the drive here. And I was like, God. Like, why am I feeling this way? I'm trying to do your work. I'm trying to be obedient to you. You got to get my back. Like, don't let this anxiety crop up on me. And then he reminded me, he said, Scott, this ain't, this is, this ain't about you. Well, well okay. He's, and it's as if he, we had that conversation. Why is it, it always got to be about you? Like, like what I'm asking you to is to a, follow me, be sensitive to when my Holy Spirit moves on you, right? When he moves, I want you to pay attention. And when things happen, I don't want you to take it on yourself, but I want to recognize your role and place in it. I said, okay, okay, okay. He says, like when you feel anxiety when you walk into a place or maybe when you've walked into your home or maybe when you walk into your business and you feel like, hey, there's something off. Have you ever noticed that sometimes we give in to it and come down to it so that we can have dialogue with it because we think we can control it? See, what he's trying to say right there is that's the dependency. That's the thing. I don't want you to come down and have a conversation with it. I want you to recognize that I'm the Lord of all things. And, and, and if I bring it to your attention, I brought it to your attention so you knew how to pray about it, not how to be burdened by it. Come on, to intercede on behalf of what would be in the room. And so what I begin to pray for you this morning is that every seed of anxiety be broken in the name of Jesus. That every unclear thought that is going to be represented in this room that would fall pray to, bend its knee to, to the God and the creator of the universe, right? I shifted how I began to embrace it in the car. And then when I finally realized I'm, you're calling me to be a part of the solution, and then you begin to pray, and then immediately you can just feel a break. Yes. Why? Because he doesn't want to just do life at you. He's wanting to do life through you, with you. And we discount or we disqualify ourselves when we don't, we don't just sit in the place of waiting and letting to de develop it. People will push you out. People will push you out because they think that's the best thing to do. People want that for you, and that's to be commended. Moms, you do this with your kids. God, we all, we've all done this with kids. We believe our kids to be the greatest kids that can do anything. They can't do anything. They can't do anything. I mean, what a bad teaching. Does anyone agree with me on that? Well, you can be the president one day. Nope, you're, you're, not, you're probably not going to be the president. He, he's not going to be the president. No, I know you think, well, that is just, you can't say that about your child. You're, you're reading, you're downgrading his potential. Like, no, I'm, I'm just telling you. I'm, I'm telling you. Uh, just little things. Like, he's not, he, we haven't made family decisions to put him into a place where that would matter. There's just one basic, simple thing. I'm like, but I can tell you what he is going to have a value for is ministry. I'm not saying, I'm not calling my kid to ministry. God calls people to ministry. But I'm going to tell you what, he's going to have a better value for that because that's what we carry as a family. It's not odd. It's why dads were passing on generational things to their sons. They were raising them in environments that fed into what they, do you see how, it's not difficult. 
God, we make things so politically correct, like you can't speak the truth. But I'm just trying to tell you, at the end of the day, like, like we have to be able to say, God, you're in control. Now listen, if God wants my kid to be the president, you can't get in the way of it. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm confident in that, right? But, but, but you, you know, I know us and look. <laughs> Sorry, bro. <laughs> That's what I'd say. I mean, I have a feeling I'm going to have to apologize to my kids a lot. <laughs> like, like oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. You got that from me. Yeah, I hate that. That's a terrible. Okay. Okay. I'm finishing up. Promise. Finishing up. Can you give me just a couple of minutes more? Do you mind? A couple of minutes. Not much more. Not really. Not much more. Because we're going to end with something real important. So don't leave. I know you want to leave, but don't leave yet. I want to end with something because we're going to wait. I'm going to show you how to model it. <laughs> like I'll put that pressure on the people leaving. <laughs> da, 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 don't get out of your. <laughs> Just kidding. James one seven dependency. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from. Coming down from the Father of lights, whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Come on. No variation. No turning. He's perfect. He's, he's the perfect gift. He's right. When, when, when I think he's wrong, he's right. Come on. He's, he's good and loving and kind and true and righteous and just even when I don't think he, sh he is or when I think he's been just when he shouldn't have been. Oh, but he's still so true. and he, he wants our dependency. He wants to know that you can count on him in that way. Yeah, but I'm, I'm trying to get this up off the ground. I'm trying to do this and I'm trying to do this. Could, can I maybe just make a, a slight suggestion? If all that trying has only got you what you got, Can we just maybe try waiting? Just try waiting. I'm not saying I'm not, I'm not saying just change everything, but I'm just saying like you've been doing, you've been doing, you've been grinding, you've been this, you've been that, and it's just still flat. Can I can I suggest something that maybe God's trying to develop something in you? Is that it's not actually thing you're pursuing is wrong. It's that the posture of where you're at is wrong. Is it because the, the, the destination isn't the end game for him? You getting what you want isn't the thing that brings joy and advancement to the kingdom of God. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, that's, um, that's a scary place to be. I'm just, don't throw anything at me. The good news about our church is all we have is like paper in the back of the, the chair. So <laughs> it ain't getting very far. But in an old school church, there used to be books could be thrown up here. So that... You had to watch out for. But, but, but hear me, like there's a, there's a place that we have to get to. We really have to get to this place where we, we, we can trust him because he's, he's, just, he's just that capable. Okay, can, can I give you another example? I thought this was interesting. Like Pastor Jay was talking about, uh, I'm going fishing. Remember, I'm going fishing. Peter's declaration to everybody say, come go with me. I'm giving up. I'm going fishing. I'm going to go do what I used to do. You guys remember this? Um, if you don't, you can go back and read it. But in Acts, and he's talking about this, and he's saying, I'm, I'm out of here. Uh, I'm going. But why is he making such a big declaration, especially in light of what Jesus had told them the last time they were together in a supper? And he said, look, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. I, I have something for you. I have something for you, and it's coming. But here's the thing. I am commanding you to stay put. Stay in Jerusalem, and then I'm sending you the promised Holy Spirit. Now, I want to just stop right here. Does anyone else find it? This scripture is fascinating to me in this sense, is that is why would God have them stay in a city where they're killing Christians? Like, folks are getting persecuted in here. So he, he's having the disciples. I want you to wait huh, in a place of persecution. I want you to wait there. Couldn't be any more safe than you are right here, really. 
Like, I'm just saying common sense would have said, hey, let's get a little, let's get a little pad outside of town, right? Right, where all the other criminals used to hang out, right? Like, like we're, they're all looking for us. We're going to get us a little spot out here, regroup. We're going to regroup. We're going to get in here and just, just encourage each other, right? And no, he says, no, 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 no. What I want you to do is I want you to stay right in the middle of it, and I want you to wait on me there. Second part of this that gets me, wait, wait. How, why would he ask you to wait on something he already promised was coming? Like, if he's God, can he not just give you what he said he promised? If it's a promised thing and you can count on God, why doesn't he just give it? Why do we have to go through the waiting process? Why do they have to go back and sit and wait? Why do they have to get in a place where they're waiting on something he said is already going to happen? He's God, right? He didn't have to wait. Holy Spirit could have been instantaneous. Why? There's no... Reason The Holy Spirit isn't developing better. We're not like waiting for the Holy Spirit to develop into who he is. Right? No, the Holy Spirit's been there from the beginning. And since he's been there from the beginning, why doesn't he just show up the day of Christ's return? Seems pretty good to me. Sort of like a race. Like, I come up, I tap your hand, you go down. Right? Like, it feels like it should be that simple. But, but he says, no, 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 no. This is what I want you to do. I want you to get everybody together. I want you to wait. And, and yet, even then, they can't do it. Because it's just too long. It's just too much time. But I, all I'm saying is this, is if God had made that command on their life, that in the midst of where it's really tough and difficult, and he's saying, if you'll just wait on me there, you're going to find something that you can't get on your own. And that thing is called the Holy Spirit. And even though I could reveal him to you right now, I'm trying to develop in you something that is going to change the world. And that I can't change the world if you don't have the fortitude, the faith that's been tried. If your motives aren't in check, Listen to me. If your perspective is off, then it's, gonna, it's not going to be the movement that we're supposed to. And God created this thing to go like a movement. So I need you to wait so that I can develop you. That waiting wasn't they lost anything. It wasn't as though they lost something. It's where the lost things go. It's in a secret place. It's in a place in him that says you can trust me with it. It's a place where you, even though you may not be seeing the development and the quickness of it, but it's a place where you can lean into and say, God, I trust you with every area of my life. And in this area, even though I don't see any momentum, I know this, you only know momentum. Which means even though I can't see it, you're already working for my behalf. This is a posture that if we can live in it, then we can have peace that passes understanding. That's that that he's speaking of. That's the thing that's uncommon, unknown peace, is that a trusting him in spite of what persecution is going on around me. Because he's developing something in me. How do we do it? We do it by... Stealing away, spending time with him, being patient, asking God to discipline the areas that we walk through today. But there's one way to get recentered immediately, and we're going to do it today. Anybody have a guess? It's in your hand or in the seat, wherever you put it when you thought I forgot we were doing communion. And I want the band to join me up here. And I'm going to ask, babe, will you, thank you. See, one, one of the critical pieces to our story as believers, and that is this one simple act. It, and though it, it's simple, it's, 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 it's rather complicated in the sense that it costs so much. This, this that we're remembering this morning is not just some ritual Gosh, help us if it's become a ritual. This is a lifestyle. It is, it is the remembering factor of the body of Christ. It's a chance for us to get centered again. See, when, when life gets really, really difficult and trials come and, and you feel like you've, you've experienced 
you've expelled all you have. Your energy is, is, is all you've given. You, you, you're depleted in every area of life. I, can I tell you, it's this simple act of quieting yourself before your God and reminding, listen, he doesn't need to be reminded of the sacrifice you do. It's a reminder that, that he paid for something. It's the reminder that says, God, you died for me and you, you made a sacrifice on my behalf. And, and, and even more than that, you're, you're my healing and you're my provider. Yeah. Right? You see, you, see, you see how the waiting, I wonder, I wonder, how, I wonder, I wonder how Jesus felt because he lived in a constant state of waiting. Amen. Is that not fair? I don't know, waiting for his ministry to start? Maybe, maybe he was waiting for the impact of his ministry to take effect. May, waiting to receive his glory? You think he can relate to where you're at in the waiting? How long did he have to wait? At death's door so that all can be completed. I'm talking like there's, there's a waiting that he understands about. And here's the cool part about waiting with him and, and that when we learn how to wait successfully with him, he, and he develops these things inside of us. He also gives us an appreciation for others. How many of you ever noticed that in waiting with the Lord that his priority was always others? Uh, the proof of that is in, in uh, uh, well, his life is proof of that, but like in one action, this one in particular, is that when he served the disciples that night, he washed their feet. Remember, he cleansed them. He, 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 he took the posture of servant. And then even in the act of communion, when he reaches out and chooses the bread, right? When he takes bread and then he blesses it, then he breaks it and then he gives it. See, these are all, these are all actions that, that became known to the, the follower of Christ. They, they were important. They're actually steps for us in our life where God has chosen you. You need to know this morning you've been chosen. You need to know that you've been blessed and you are highly favored because you're his. Not because of what you have, but because you, who you are in conjunction with Christ. Like you're, you're, you're blessed beyond measure. Okay, so there's a blessing, but how, how many can relate to this? There's a place where he's gonna, there's gonna be a breaking in your life. And in the breaking, it's not so that you're broken hearted, but that you can be served up to others. It's to be a blessing to others. He was, he's always everything that he did so intentional. And, and so when you're in a place of waiting, the quickest way to get recalibrated back to where we're supposed to be, Max, you know this is, is to get before a God who made an ultimate sacrifice and say, I recognize whatever I have been trying to do has come up short, but God, what you did has been complete. It's, it's a place, it's a posturing of a heart. So would you stand with me? I want to do that with you today because I believe this is how we can model. I want to model for you, right? And we can do this all the time. My wife, big group of us actually, there's a whole group of us that um, have, have been inspired to stay on top of taking communion at all. I mean, when there's any kind of sickness in the house, we sit down and we have communion. When we have a big question or something we're facing, we sit down and have communion. When we're facing anything, we just know that there's a place where we gotta stop and commune with God. Like because the temptation is to try to do it on my own. The temptation is to fix it. How many fixers are in the room? You know what I'm talking about? You're just a fixer. Like you hear a problem and you wanna bring the solution. Because I just, you're, you're wired for it. And yet I'm trying to tell you the real fix is being recentered to Him. Because that's where the blessing is. That's where the favor is at. So if you would, would you just take your, your bread out here? Uh, your, uh, your styrofoam piece, whatever. <laughs> whatever you're eating today. Bread. <laughs> this, this, this represents the breaking of his body. 
See, broke, he, his body's broken for you. Not, not just for a group of people, not for a person. No, for every man, woman, boy, and girl, it was broken. Not, not his bones, but his flesh. Broken. His blood spilled for us, but this bearing stripes on his back so that we could be healed, so that we can have a a kinsman redeemer in Jesus. You, you know what I'm saying? Like, like he, he's, he is the provider of, of, of our safety and our, and our, our emotions and our, and our love. And, 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 and there's an immense amount of grace in him. It goes beyond my, my past or my thoughts or, or whatever may be rewired in me. He says, if you'll just submit that to me, I can fix all that. And and it's as simple as acknowledging me and acknowledging the sacrifice that was made. He says when we do this, we do it in remembrance of him, right? It's in the place where we remember his goodness, his faithfulness, his kindness, but it's also in a place where we do it as a body where we remember the body back together. You realize he's the common denominator for every one of us in this room. It is Jesus. This morning we recognize you, Jesus. We thank you. We thank you for the sacrifice that was made. We do not take lightly that that you did on the cross, God. You and you alone get the credit for that. Jesus, we are but benefactors of your goodness and your faithfulness and your kindness. And God, we just say this morning, yes, we recommit, God, our lives, God, to your ways, not our ways. God, with the, the frustrations and the trials and the, and, the, and the confusion and the anxiety and, and the frustration, all the things that come with life and life's trials and troubles, God, we, we simply submit those back to you, God, and we say, you be glorified. You be lifted up. You be exalted in this life, God. God, would you do on this earth through me what only you can do, God? We step outside of our agendas and our motives, God. And we say, God, you have your glory through our life. God, you said that anyone who's sick, let them come. Let them come. Let them ask. And God, we come to you today, God, in broken heart, broken body, broken spirit. And we simply say, God, would you be the God of this immortal flesh, God, of this man, this weak, and God, we need you this morning. We're asking that you'd refocus us, recenter us to your will and to your plan and to your ways and give us the courage and the grace to wait patiently on what you're trying to do. Develop in us what you need. Develop in us what we don't even know we need for what you have planned for us is great and beyond anything we can understand, think, and imagine. Now take and eat. We bless you, Jesus. In the same manner, he, he took the cup. And the thing about the cup is, you know, it's a covenant. And so, I, I'm sure you already know this, but, but in every, every covenant, there's always a strong side and weak side of the covenant. Yeah? It's not like two equal parts. The fact that there needs to be a covenant re- says that there's someone who's taking on a big portion of this. And, and I'm just going to have you guess which side we're on. <laughs> We're, we're kind of on the inferior side of it on this one. The beauty is, is he did it willingly. The beauty is, is he said, it's not just any covenant, it's the new covenant. It's, it's greater than the old one. And, and the cool part about this covenant is that we're still living in its principles and in its value is still being upheld in us today. And he says, he'll not drink of this cup till he does it again with us. It's a promise. 
It's not, it's not like, like, so what we were talking about earlier, we're, we're talking about like the promise of the Holy Spirit. You can count on it. It's not, it's, not a, it's not a suggestion. It's not like, hey, you know, I, I may wait on you guys, but I might get thirsty in between now and then. This isn't about thirst. This isn't about fulfilling what he said he would do as he sits patiently waiting on when the Father says to go get you. <laughs> Right? He's in a constant state of waiting, waiting and yet not, not frustrated, not moved, not worried, not concerned, not worried that the devil might take a little more ground today than he. There's no fear in his eyes. There's no weariness. And, and if that's the case, he said, I have a covenant with you that says I can pull you into something you couldn't do for yourself. I'm asking him this morning, pull me into that kind of confidence. Pull me into that kind of strength and grace that only you can do. That's the covenant. That's a blood covenant that he shed for us. Isn't that magnificent? Lord, we honor you today. We thank you for the shedding of your blood. We thank you that you did it on behalf of us. God, you, man, you... You did more for us in this covenant than we could do for ourselves, and we credit you today. We recognize you. God, we recognize that it's not just your blood that is spilled, God, but it's your blood that has been applied to our hearts, that makes us recognizable to the Father, that it gives us access to be able to boldly come in to ask anything that we want to ask because it's your blood that qualifies us. God, we bless you today. We thank you that you and you alone made this possible. And we celebrate you today in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's drink. Come on, come on. Doesn't it feel good? Yeah? Listen, um, we would normally pass around the buckets. We're going to hold the buckets. You just drop it out at the door on your way out. Can we just do this real quick? Can we just thank God for how good he is? Come on, can you do that? Come on, can you just thank him? Hey, he's so great. Man, he's great. Hey, can, I want to say this to you. On behalf of The Rock and, and everyone here on staff, man, we love and appreciate you. On behalf of Pastor Rusty and Lisa specifically, how much they love and care for you. And it's an absolute joy to serve this house. It's an absolute joy to serve here. And listen, we love you. We can't wait to be with you. Don't miss next week. Pastor Johnny Jernigan is going to be here. I promise you, you will not regret taking the time to be here. It's going to be a wonderful service. We love you. Asking God to bless you as you go this week. How many are encouraged? Feel like you can go into the waiting season a little bit better? Awesome. God bless you. We'll see you next week. Have a wonderful week.